uh, aloha everyone and happy new year. Um, thank you all for joining us for our weekly Hanama talk seminar series presented by the Hawaii Sea Grant Hanama Bay Education Program. Um, my name is Gavin Y, and I am the outreach program coordinator for the education program. First off, I would like to introduce Fred Repung, who is the education coordinator for the Heia National Estuarian Research Reserve or NERR. He'll be giving a more in-depth introduction about this organization um, see, in the second talk of his collection of presentations, as well as introducing our other two speakers for tonight's talk. A few reminders before Fred introduces our speakers though, please keep all your questions to the end of the presentation or um, please type them in the chat room at any time. Also, please remember to turn off your microphone as well as your video during the presentations. So with that, uh, Fred, would you please talk a little bit about the HEIA NERR program as well as introducing our two feature speakers as well as yourself. Yes, thanks Kevin. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining tonight. Uh, my name is Fred Rapoon. I work for the Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve. And I know that's the mouthful. Uh, good job, Gavin, taking that one on. Um, for short, we call it the NER um, or just the reserve. And um, I wanted to, to, again, thank Gavin for having us on. And um, this is the, the first of a few Hanama Bay talks that are gonna focus on uh, the Heia NER. And um, tonight, uh, the theme is going to be climate change. And um, we're going to sort of take a, a funnel approach. So we're going to start uh, wide at the, the Pacific region scale. And we have Zena Greckney uh, to talk about um, some of cli the climate change impacts to the Pacific region. Uh, Zena is the Sustained Climate Assessment Specialist for Pacific RISA, which is a team that works to uh, support Pacific Island adaptation initiatives. Um, she also happens to be my wife and she's sitting right here. Want to wave to the camera? <laughs> there, there's your hand. Um, and then uh, next up we have me and I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth about uh, the Heiener and the past, uh, present and uh, look to the future and what climate change might bring to that area. And then uh, we have Evan Lechner, who's going to uh, zoom in on one part of Heia, which is Heia Fish Pond. And Evan is a graduate student in oceanography at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. And he and his advisor, Chris Sabine, Sabine are working to understand ocean chemistry and particularly uh, look at the chemistry of coastal estuaries in Hawaii. Um, and particularly the fish ponds, which are not well studied. Uh, so Evan is going to, to zoom in and look at some of uh, climate change impacts uh, on that system. So before we get started, um, I wanted to just provide a brief overview of what the NER even is. And um, let me see if I can share my screen and show you guys just where on the map we are. So one second. Here we go. So the Heia NER is part of a national estuarine research reserve system. And there are 29 reserves around the country, uh, all dedicated to uh, research, education, and stewardship of our estuaries. By the way, if you have never heard the word before, um, an estuary is a place where a river flows into the ocean. Um, one of my fellow educators likes to make people guess the word. He says it starts with an S and it ends with a chuary. Uh, people always guess sanctuary, uh, but now, you know, it's estuary. Um, so our estuary is located in the Ahupua of Heia, which is right here. Um, that is located in the larger Moku or uh, traditional land division of Ko'olaupoko. And it's interesting that um, it's actually the same moku that Hanama Bay is part of. You can see Hanama Bay down here in the corner. Um, so the Heia Nur is actually the lower part of the Ahupua of Heia, uh, encompasses some wetlands um, in between Kahekili and Kamehameha Highway, uh, Heia Fish Pond on the coastline, and then some of the coral reefs and the island of Mokuoloe in Kaneohe Bay. 
So that is um, the location of, of our reserve. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Zena to uh, zoom out and give us an overview of the climate impacts on the Pacific region. Thank you, Fred, for that warm introduction and for um, telling us a little bit about the Haiti and NUR. Um, I'm really happy to be part of today's uh, seminar and to talk with you about climate change and the Pacific Islands, how it's affecting oceans and the people that rely on the ocean, and give some insight into how communities are preparing and adapting to that change. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. This will work. All right. And um, as Fred said, I work with the Pacific Visa Program, a program funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, really to provide support to Pacific Island decision makers and communities in adapting to climate change. Um, the region where we work um, is this one. It is the US affiliated Pacific Islands, as it's called. Um, it's vast and very diverse, encompassing an area in the Pacific larger than the continental United States um, and containing more than 2,000 islands. Uh, it's uh, got islands that are low-lying um, atolls, like in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and islands that are high volcanic islands, like here in Hawaii. Um, it's just as diverse politically and culturally as it is geographically. Um, it includes the state of Hawaii, um, two U.S. territories, American Samoa and Guam, a commonwealth, and three nations that are actually freely associated with the U.S. Um, through a compact of free association. Um, and so um, it's quite challenging to work in such a large region, but also um, really rewarding. Um, the region has incredible hotspots of ecological biodiversity. You can see the green regions are protected areas like Papahana, Mokuakea, um, and other um, marine national monuments and, and protected areas. Um, working in such a, a large and um, diverse region, we're faced with a challenge um, of working with many partners, which is also um, kind of how we come together and deliver climate science um, in accessible, um, useful formats. So we, we work on reports, um, climate assessments, as we call them, to update everyone on the science and to inform decisions. And we do this through an umbrella organization called the Pacific Islands Regional Climate Assessment, or PERCA. Um, and one thing that PERCA has worked on together as a group um, has been on the national climate assessment. So we contributed a chapter to the fourth U.S. national climate assessment that talked about Hawaii and Pacific Islands and was an assessment of the state of knowledge about climate change, its risks, impacts, and adaptation, um, the status of adaptation in communities. Um, and one big core finding um, overall for the report as a whole was that Earth's climate is now changing faster than at any point in the history of modern civilization, and it's primarily a result of human activities. Um, this report is uh, unique in the sense that it involves all 13 federal agencies, more than 300 authors from the federal government, and also authors like us who are not federal. Um, and it went through multiple phases of review, uh, through public review, review by the National Academy of Sciences, and um, it's also updated regularly. So it's quite credible and authoritative. Um, the next uh, national climate assessment is due out in 2022. That is, if we follow the, the time frame set out by the um, act of Congress that created the assessment. Uh, you can find it at um, this, this latest assessment at nca2018.globalchange.gov. And I talk about the fourth national climate assessment because I'm going to highlight a lot of findings from it. And this figure appeared in it kind of summarizing how we know climate is changing in the Pacific Islands. So what are the ways that we're able to measure and observe um, and track um, and see that um, everything around us um, is um, shifting from historic conditions. So we know, for example, that sea level is rising, that air and sea temperatures are rising, that ocean chemistry is changing, um, that rainfall patterns are changing, uh, in the Pacific Islands, um, base flow and streams, 
That is the average flow of streams is, is, is changing and declining in a lot of islands. Um, and, and these impacts or indicators, I should say, have real uh, effects and impacts on our lives and um, our environments locally. <laughs> so I think I tried to focus um, some points here from the assessment as a whole and from our work um, that focus on ecosystems and oceans and the people that rely on them. And so I first wanted to highlight that sea level rise and increasingly powerful storms that are fueled by hotter ocean temperatures and a more unstable atmosphere are already affecting um, species like nesting seabirds, turtles, and seals. The photo on the left is East Island in the French frigate shoals. And it's a critical breeding ground for monk seals. Um, as well as a nesting habitat for the Hawaiian green sea turtle. Uh, and you can see on the right, the photo shows that island after Hurricane Wallaka ran through it in 2018. So the track of this hurricane is not a function of climate change. Um, hurricanes um, respond to many factors um, in the ocean and atmosphere, but the power of this hurricane to effectively erase an entire island um, is consistent with global warming. Um, and so, um, you know, we need to think about, as the James Campbell National Wildlife Refuge is thinking about how to help seabirds by either relocating them and, and developing hatching programs in alternative places um, that can be more resilient um, and can withstand the changes to come. Uh, we are also seeing um, impacts to our coral reefs. So in Hawaii, coral reefs, as you know, are incredibly important. Um, not just for the environmental value and um, appreciation for, for snorkeling and other activities, but also for our economy. They add $364 million annually, it's estimated, to Hawaii's economy. Um, reefs um, across the region are bleaching more frequently and um, with greater magnitude um, due to ocean warming. And we've seen this recently in the third global bleaching event, which was fueled by climate change um, in 2014 through 2017 when reefs repeatedly bleached um, in Hawaii and elsewhere in the Pacific. And this map shows uh, the year of projected onset of annual severe bleaching. So bleaching that happens every single year. Um, and it's not 100 years away, it's actually projected to happen um, for Hawaii in about 2040 across the island. Um, and so uh, we have yet to see, and hopefully the Hay and can help us see um, how uh, reefs may be resilient to this, in what ways can we help them be resilient, and how they might adapt um, um, and, and remain functional. Of course, pelagic fisheries are also incredibly important in Hawaii, um, as they are um, in economies like American Samoa. Um, Hawaii's longline fisheries account for $100 million annually. Um, and for these deep open ocean fisheries, Climate change means changing fish stocks, changing species migrations as they respond to different temperature regimes. Um, and overall declines in tuna and billfish yields are projected um, two to 5% decline per decade in this century. Uh, as you know, the majority of Pacific Island communities, even here in Hawaii, we actually are lucky because we have high islands, but even in Hawaii, the majority of communities are confined to a narrow band of land within a few feet of sea level. Um, so all of our transportation infrastructure, our harbors, our airports, housing, businesses, tourism infrastructure concentrated along the coast. And so sea level rise is um, increasingly impacting um, areas. It's accelerated in the region and already become damaging with coastal, increased coastal erosion, um, inundation, saltwater intrusion. Um, I know folks have probably seen the King Tide events here. And um, those are, are natural events that happen, but sea level rise is adding um, an additional level of rise onto that that is increasing over time. Um, you've probably gone down to the shoreline and seen waves actually washing over the roads or onto beaches and seawalls, um, and possibly um, seeing the sand um, deposits afterward. This map in the background is from the state of Hawaii Sea Level Rise Viewer, which is part of a big study that the state did on which areas are exposed to future sea level rise. And it shows um, inundation. So there's a, this is the exposure area from events like King Tides plus sea level rise. And um, this is under a 3.2 feet sea level rise scenario, which is considered like a middle of the road 
um, considered likely by 2100. Um, sea level rise, uh, science is evolving, and scientists are, are learning that it could be much worse than previously thought based on recent studies of Arctic sea ice loss and other loss of large um, ice bodies around the world um, being fa happening faster and, and more than we thought before. Um, and they can't rule out the possibility, I've been told, of eight feet of sea level rise by 2100. So there's a large range and we need to really keep up on the science and update it continuously. Um, for Hawaii, of course, this means potentially large losses. Um, there were $19 billion in losses estimated in this 2018 report on sea level, um, just from the loss to, of property value, um, buildings and roads, uh, not including things like losses in tourism revenue. Um, so the scale is large. And the state and county, city and county of Honolulu are both starting to respond. Um, they both created climate change commissions to advise the governor, to advise the mayor, to advise um, the state uh, House of Representatives. And um, the state of Hawaii has also adopted some planning benchmarks of 3.3 feet of sea level rise by 2100, but they've accommodated um, a benchmark of six feet by 2100 to account for that more high end range of warming and rise that we could see. Uh, and this uh, benchmark is applicable to all state agencies, city and county departments, um, anybody that's doing um, capital improve, improvement planning, making large expenditures has to account for this. Um, and they're inviting um, public uh, participation, for example, by the resilience office um, of the Honolulu uh, government um, is inviting uh, participation in planning and setting a climate change strategy to respond to all the different impacts, um, particularly from sea level rise. So away from urban areas, many communities rely on water sources and food sources that are directly at sea level. This photo is the um, main freshwater source for the island, an atoll of Majuro and the Marshall Islands. And you can see how vulnerable it is to sea level rise just sitting right there um, next, to the, next to the coast on both sides. So in atolls, high water events directly threaten um, their freshwater supplies and their food supplies. Um, indigenous people in Pacific Islands are on the front line of climate change impacts um, and also on the front, uh, at the forefront of solutions. So the rich cultural heritage of the Pacific comprises you know, spiritual, relational, and ancestral interconnectedness with the environment. And so climate change threatens this familial relationship and um, the lands, waters, livelihoods, um, cultural food security and significant cultural sites um, that are part of the environment. Um, in Hawaii, they're already seeing impacts. So um, the top photo here is of a salt pond on Kauai. And I've been told by practitioners there that they're already having trouble accessing it in certain seasons and during certain high tide events due to um, natural um, cycles and sea level rise on top of that. Um, on the lower panel, um, the good news is that islands have become sort of test beds for innovation and some communities are actively building resilience to climate change. Um, the photo below is a group of fish pond managers and cultural practitioners that have convened with Hawaii climate scientists to understand climate change, its projections, use the best available science to integrate into their management of cultural resources to know how to change um, how they um, steward these resources so that they're um, going to be sustainable in the long run. And I wanted to quickly highlight one um, other example that's inspiring, which is that of the Republic of Palau. Um, this is a small island nation in the Southwest Pacific. I've highlighted or circled it in blue here, its location. Um, it's uh, like Hawaii, very dependent on tourism from its environment. Um, it gets 23% of the GDP from coral reef-based tourism. Um, and with a small population, um, they can do things to balance the economic growth with measures that protect um, natural resources and help them to be more resilient. Um, and um, particularly um, inspiring um, from this country is um, President Tommy Rumangasau, who's um, been named a UN Champion of the Earth, 
uh, and he's just finishing out his second um, stint as president. He was president for eight years and beginning around 2000 and then president for another eight years, two terms um, in the last eight years. And over the course of that time has led the country to protect 80% of its marine territory. So although Palau is a small island nation, um, small population, small land area, it's actually a large ocean state because it stewards a huge body of water um, within their e exclusive economic zone. And so protecting this marine territory means no takings, no fishing, um, no extractive industries. Um, and with the remaining 20%, they've put it in to dom domestic fishing only, so protected it in that way as well. And this is recognizing that Palau's main economic driver and um, its main asset is its reef, is its habitat. And that um, climate change was a main motivating factor for taking this aggressive action toward protecting resources because it makes it all the more important to allow these resources to be as resilient as possible um, without, um, by eliminating other, other non-climate stressors like overfishing. Palau has also adopted a green fee, um, which is a small fee that every visitor there um, to Palau pays, um, and it helps to go into the management and protection of the resources. In addition to that, every vis visitor takes the Palau Pledge, which um, you normally would get a stamp in your passport when you visit a country. Well, the same is true for Palau, except the stamp is, is a pledge that you have to sign. And so when I was there, I signed this pledge to the children of Palau that I would take care of the resources um, as if they were, um, you know, so that they could enjoy them in the rest of their lifetimes while, um, while I was visiting. Um, and so uh, Palau highlights really um, balancing this economic growth with measures for sustainability and how that can improve the chances that um, these uh, important resources and the communities that rely on them will be able to continue, continue even with the changes to come. And um, I wanna end there and happy to answer questions at sort of the end of all of the presentations um, or feel free to reach out to me or um, my boss, Victoria Keener, at any time by email. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dina. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen and uh, get into uh, my talk about AIA specifically. Okay. Hopefully, you all can see that. So, this talk is going to focus on the Aupua of Heia and um, its uh, past and uh, some of the current work that's going on there and uh, some of the impacts of climate change that uh, it might face in the future. When I think about climate change, it really starts to hit home when I think about the places that are beloved in the community uh, where I live. And, um, in Heia, those things include uh, this traditional Hawaiian fish pond, which is over 800 years old. Um, it uh, is over 80 acres and uh, is currently being restored to be able to produce fish again for the community. Um, the people who love this pond the most, I would say, are the ones who are rebuilding it rock by rock and have been doing so for the last 20 years. Uh, it also includes uh, floating column wetland and cattle patches uh, in the wetland just um, north of the fish pond. Um, this area used to be in production with taro and at one time rice, and it's currently being restored. And again, I think it's most loved by the people who have actually been there, uh, many volunteers, and of course the staff who go there every day um, and have built out these, these loggy, these patches. Um, one at a time and, and replanted the um, in the wetland. Um, and uh, of course, it inc includes the waters of Heia. Uh, everyone in the community uh, loves to be out on the bay, go fishing. Um, 
we're fortunate to have the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology uh, within the Ahupua'a Heia. And of course, the, the researchers there are, um, I would say, some of the people who, who love their subjects the most. Um, and the, the things that are studied are everything from the humpback whales uh, all the way down to the coral polyps um, and everything in between. And so all of these things are, are part of the, the ocean ecosystem of the area and um, are, are much loved by the community. Um, these things are loved, I think, because they've provided for the community over many generations. Um, if we look at uh, the Loikalo, um, even as, as late as 1906, when this map was drawn, uh, you can see that there were hundreds of acres in production um, in just the Kanawe Bay area, all those, those blue shaded um, areas. If we look at the, the fish ponds, the local Ia, uh, this small stretch of coastline from Heia to Kaneohe, uh, everywhere you see a blue X was a fish pond. Um, at one time, 30% of the shoreline of Kaneohe Bay was fish pond, and there were 30 ponds in total. And these, these things, these, um, in, these uh, innovations um, were part of a larger system called the Ahupua'a system, and they functioned together to provide food for the community in a way that didn't damage significantly the natural resources that they depended on. And so they were able to sustain that production over uh, many generations. I think these things are also beloved because they remind the community of all of the challenges that it has faced over the years. Um, so on land, like many places in Hawaii, traditional agriculture gave way to industrialized um, agriculture. Uh, pineapple and sugar were a big part of the history of the Kanye Bay Area as they were um, elsewhere in the state. And um, those types of agriculture um, degraded the soil. They, they uh, didn't really pay attention to you know, the, the characteristics of the place and led to massive erosion uh, into the bay, um, depletion of the soil. Um, and so the, the these newer systems really started to stress the natural resource um, on which they depended. If we look at the coastline, um, keep your eye on some of those fish ponds. So over time, uh, as the bay developed, the population grew. Um, those many of those ponds were filled in, um, and houses were built on them. So we've lost a lot of the fish ponds in the area. Um, luckily for us, hey, a fish pond was not one of them that was lost, but it was close. Um, this was the plan for a fish pond at one time. And uh, so you can see the, the, this pamphlet from the 1950s advertising um, houses uh, in the area. So the wetland was going to be houses and a golf course, and the fish pond was uh, going to be a marina. Um, so this is Panama Bay, and you can see down in the the lower part of the, these photos. Uh, Hanama Bay, uh, right next door to Hanama Bay, um, Hawaii Kai, that, that whole area did not escape um, the fate of development. Uh, you can see that a lot of the, the fish ponds and ocean areas were filled in and, and houses kind of took their place. Um, so again, yeah, we're very lucky in the area to have what we have still. Um, also, the, in the 1930s and 40s, the, the buildup to World War II and militarization of the, of the bay, um, they dredged a lot of the coral reefs to uh, get material for runways. And you can see the, the scratch marks um, on the reefs in the bay in this photo, um, both to make runways and to uh, make shipping channels for deep draft ships. So that, this was not just direct damage to the coral, but it also kicked up a lot of sediment. Um, which, uh, which continues to be a problem to this day uh, when it settles on the, the coral reefs. Um, we've also had to deal with invasive species. Uh, this is a picture of the Long Bridge, as it's called, the Mamea Highway, uh, around 1920, I believe. Um, you can see that the mouth of Heia Stream is quite open. Um, 
this is a picture of that same bridge in 2016. So um, mangroves, which are a tree that's not native to Hawaii, was planted in the area in the late 1920s. And they filled in and effectively cut off the flow of water uh, going into the ocean. Um, and so this had all kinds of implications for uh, fish uh, being able to swim up and down, um, leaf litter uh, causing sediment to go out into the bay, uh, et cetera. So again, luckily for us, um, some of the kupuna, the elders of the area, had seen what Keia was, they saw what was happening to it, and they knew what it could still be. And so they, um, you know, really dedicated their lives to protecting um, some of these places from uh, these different threats that, that were faced. And uh, it was them who first had the vision of um, establishing a reserve um, that could help coordinate some of the restoration efforts in the area. So this picture on the right is Heia in 1928. And you can see the, the wetland in production with taro and, and some rice at that time and the fish pond uh, fully functional. Um, and again, it was part of the larger aquatic system. And that's, this is really what we're aiming for when we talk about restoration. And um, the way we think the system works is that each zone in the Ahupua provided some services to the one beneath so that erosion coming from the upland area was trapped by the, the Lodi, um, which then released only nutrients out into the bay, which fueled fish pond production, uh, et cetera. So we think that this is how the system may have worked in part. Um, but as we start to restore these different things, we're trying to conduct research to figure out whether, whether that's true or not. Um, so some of the, the things we've learned so far is that as these lohi are being built out, they are trapping sediment. Um, in this picture, you can see uh, a, a core of soil taken out of a taro patch. And everything above that white blob is um, sediment that's accumulated in that patch over the last year. So they're, they're kind of doing their job, which is really a hopeful sign. Um, this is that same bridge again. Um, a lot of the mangroves have been removed and um, the, the wetland is being opened up again. And I see Nalani on the call. Um, she's been one of the people uh, tirelessly working to remove mangrove in that area. And um, as the wetland opens up again, um, we see uh, the native birds coming back. So this is the, the Hawaiian stilt or Iho, which uh, forages in, in open wetlands. Um, and we see other birds like the Alai Ula, uh, which nests in the, in the uh, taro patches. Um, we see fish coming back like mullet and a hole hole that swim uh, up and down from salt water to fresh water um, on a daily basis. Um, we see oopu, um, which are a species that uh, swims from pretty much the mountain streams all the way out to the deep ocean uh, over the course of its life and, and back again. We're seeing them start to come back. Um, which is all great signs, uh, it's really encouraging, but um, we still wanna keep track of these things as the restoration proceeds. Um, as we go from you know, a few acres of lo'i to um, 100 acres eventually, is it gonna um, still provide those same kind of services to the ecosystem? And of course, we really wanna keep track of these things um, and see how they interact with climate change. Um, so just in terms of sea level rise, um, you can see from the, the top map, um, under three feet of sea level rise, the wall of the fish pond is already very much underwater. Um, and that salt water is starting to push uh, farther up into the wetland itself. And, and then of course, under six feet of sea level rise, which is possible uh, by 2100, um, it's, it's an even more drastic situation. So, um, we're trying to uh, keep track of sea level rise and how the level of the wetland changes as the water rises. Oh, this is uh, another picture on the ground what that looks like. We kind of already know from the King Tide events that have happened and inundated the wall of the fish pond. Um, 
making it uh, necessary to repair certain sections um, and uh, remove plastic from the wall when it gets washed up and things like that. Um, on the, the wetland side, um, we're trying to think about how changes in rainfall are going to affect things. So one possibility is that rainfall is going to decrease, which means probably less stream flow. Um, we know that Taro really needs cold water uh, in order to grow well. It needs a lot of uh, cold flowing water. Um, we know that related fish, stream fish, the Oopu, also need cold water. Uh, with warmer water, they tend to get more diseases and parasites and things like that. Um, and so if streamfall is declining and air temperatures are going up, um, that means that whatever water is in the stream is going to heat up faster. Um, so you can see how that is going to affect um, things in the wetland and in the stream itself. Um, another possibility whoops, is that um, rainfall could increase. And if it does, it's probably going to be in the wet season uh, during big storm events. Um, so these videos are from Hilo and Kauai, but um, we all know the same thing happens on Oahu too. Um, and so are the lo'i that we're going to build out, are they enough to trap that sediment coming down and slow that water down? Or is it going to end up in, in the, like the figure in the lower right, uh, where all that mud washes out into the pond? Um, we don't know, but um, that's why we have to keep studying these things. And then, of course, um, heat in the ocean is a big uh, stress in Haiti. We're already seeing coral bleaching happen uh, in some years and with increasing frequency. Um, just to give you an, an idea of some of the research that's happening uh, at uh, HIMB, so there's a, a group there that's looking at coral polyps and how they respond to heat. And they have a, a special microscope that can actually look inside a coral polyp. And you can see on the left, uh, the healthy uh, corals, uh, all of the red color is the, the little uh, microscopic uh, plants, basically, that live inside the coral and help give them their food. And on the right, you see after a severe uh, bleaching event, those coral polyps have lost their, um, their plant um, symbionts and they're moving much more slowly. So the good thing is not all corals bleach like that. Some are with, able to withstand it. And so that is being intensively studied um, on the island to, to figure out what we can do to um, make sure that all corals are resilient. Um, we do know, however, that coral bleaching and stormwater have become the dominant stressors uh, on corals in the bay. Um, so dredging was bad, sewage was bad, but um, corals were able to bounce back from that. Um, now they just they face the bleaching and the stormwater. So hopefully we can take steps to um, slow that down over time. Okay, so who's doing all this research? Um, we really depend on students. And uh, these are just a few of the students that work in Haiti. Um, they're graduate students, they're undergraduate students, some of them are high school students. Um, they're all very passionate about what they do and about what they research. And each of them is uh, picking on a different piece of the puzzle. And um, collectively, um, we hope that uh, their efforts will help us to better understand how we can adapt and be resilient to climate change. So, I'm going to turn it over now to one of those students, Evan, and he's going to zoom in on the fish pond and um, talk to us about his research there. All you, Evan. Great. Thank you, Fred. Yeah. Um, yes, so my presentation going. There we go. So, yes. Uh, Thank you for uh, the invitation to speak and for the introduction, Fred. Um, uh, it is really awesome to be able to share uh, what my piece of the puzzle is uh, when it comes to this research. Um, so just a quick word about myself. My name is Evan Lechner. Uh, I'm a graduate student at UH Manoa, and I work with my advisor, Chris Sabine, on issues related to climate change and the carbon cycle. I am on the absolute wrong slide. 
Um, so as climate change and the carbon cycle kind of imply, we're focused on the issues related to CO2 emissions. And I'm virtually sure everybody here has probably heard a little bit about this topic. It's very well reported nowadays. Um, but the, the quick explanation is that uh, the energy we expend to do anything from uh, powering our homes, uh, running our cars, transporting goods and people back and forth from the mainland, all of that puts CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and that creates a warming effect called the greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gas effect. You can kind of liken this to how a thick blanket keeps you warm on a cold night. Basically, the blanket traps your body heat in the space between you and the blanket. Um, there's a lot of information that sort of supports this idea. Uh, the graphs here on the right basically show you at the top uh, data since the 1960s showing that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has becoming more and more common. And below, uh, you see temperature data over the same time period. And when you average that over several years, uh, as the dark line shows, uh, you see a similar trend in increasing temperature. So this is really valuable. The conclusions from this tell us a lot about how the world is changing in various different places. Um, and it also helps us sort of unlock new understandings. Um, in my case, uh, how the ocean plays a big role in this carbon chemistry question. Basically, you can think about it, the ocean will just naturally want to act like a sponge for carbon. CO2 can just dissolve into the water, uh, and once it's there, it can do a bunch of different chemical reactions, some of which cause the ocean to acidify. Yeah. Not everyone is a chemistry head, so I'm going to try not to go into the weeds too much. Um, the basic thing you want to know is that when CO2 goes into the water, it can do one of two things. Uh, the first that it can do is just combine with the water itself, as you see here in the middle, and that creates a substance called carbonic acid. The other thing that CO2 can do is that it can be picked up and utilized by biology, life. Uh, it can be part of the photosynthetic process where sugar and plant life is created, oxygen is, is uh, formed, um, and then those things get used up by other life during respiration. This is like breathing, inhaling, and exhaling. Uh, the linkage between these two pathways is really, really important. On the right-hand side with carbonic acid, this is like the, the big climate change issue with carbon in the water. This is ocean acidification at work. And it's important to note that the ocean really isn't acidic in nature. It's us adding carbon to the water that creates carbonic acid that very slowly over long periods of time adds to, you know, tips the scale towards acidifying the water. Um, but these two systems sort of work hand in hand. And it's really important that as you come into the coastline, you see that the biological pathway here can do a lot of work to sort of limit the effects of larger acidific uh, acidification. And so that's kind of where my interest at HEIA comes in. I think Fred's done like, a really great job of explaining you know, the, the layout of, of the NER and the different kinds of work that happens there. Um, so what my project is, is hoping to do is kind of look at this chemis uh, chemistry, the, the chemical indicators we have, and use that to figure out if what sorts of restoration is going on can be seen through the chemistry that we look at in the, in the water. Um, so to kind of explain that in the terms that, that Fred's gone through is that upstream at the Loewy, uh, you have the water flowing down the Ahupua, and it's nutrient rich, and it feeds the plants, um, and you get all this sort of nutrient that's uh, providing life to the ecosystem. Uh, and when the Loewy is functioning well, the soil is retained, and this prevents muddy pollution from getting out into the fish pond. Um, and as he said, when there was this large-scale switch to plantation agriculture, a lot of that service was lost, and you saw sort of muddy, uh, dark water, and it is likely to have had negative effects on, on the fish uh, in the fish pond. Similarly, as we understand the local Ia, it's, it's essentially just a wall that wraps around in a, a native ecosystem itself. It, it's, it's an installation that's built within the ecosystem rather than on top of it. Uh, it operates uh, just by having these wooden sluice gates, makaha, uh, that selectively let fish in and out but they don't interrupt the exchange of water. So the native ecosystem is basically left to be entirely as it would be uh, in nature. Um, and what's really nice about that is that the small fish that come into the fish pond basically get a, a wide diet of plankton and algae, 
and it becomes a nursery for small fish, which is what makes it such a productive source of fish for the community. Um, and unfortunately, as, as we've discussed, when you switch to the plantation agriculture, this system becomes kind of upended as pollution of soils runs out of the fish pond. And so as Fred introduced, uh, mangroves were sort of brought into the equation to try to stop some of this uh, soil pollution, um, mainly to sort of support the plantation agriculture that was occurring. And they quickly became uh, invasive. They wrapped around the fish pond uh, and really choked off the, the stream flow into the fish pond. Um, and they did kind of have the effect that they were introduced for. They developed these very thick banks of dark mud from leaf litter and other organic soils. Um, I've been at, at Hayden you know, work days myself and you can sink past your knee into the mud. Um, so it's, it's a very thick bank of organic material. Um, and that's one of the things that makes Hayea so interesting is in other parts of the world, mangroves are these vibrant and important parts of the ecosystem. But here they have a little bit of a different effect because they're invasive and not native. So that brings us kind of to where we are today. I'm hoping to sort of understand how initiatives that we make to promote sustainability and resilience in our ecosystem uh, look from a chemical perspective. Um, so as the mangroves have been removed, that thick bank of mud is now kind of free to flow again. Um, and we kind of expect that it does. Uh, I've spoken with a lot of folk that, that regularly work at the fish pond, the staff at Paipaio Heia, uh, and they will share with me, you know, totally regular reports that, you know, you find thick banks of mud at various parts of the fish pond. So we, we understand that a lot of this is starting to flow. Um, and so why we care about that is that if you remember back to the organic uh, biology part of our chemistry pathway, when you have all of this organic stuff flowing out, all sorts of different microbes and other biology is going to eat it up, and they're going to do that exhaling part of the breathing cycle, basically. You know, oxygen is going to be used up and carbon is going to be put into the water. And that could affect some of the chemistry that we see in the estuary. So it's, it's important to keep track of it. And that's kind of the motivating principle for my project. I partner very closely with the folks at the, the, fish, the fish pond, um, and they have a vested interest in understanding where oxygen is in the fish pond, because it's very important to the reliable and sustainable rearing of, of fish for the community. Um, and our opinion would be that oxygen and carbon are very closely linked because of the, the chemistry that I've shown you. So we want to follow these changes very closely. Um, so as the stream continues to flow into the fish pond, you know, more and more over recent months, um, we're beginning to see chemical changes in the fish pond. And additionally interesting uh, of interest to this, as Fred indicated, the chemistry doesn't just stop at the fish pond. The issues related to ocean acidification and the effect that these carbon changes can have could have long term implications on things like coral, both in terms of soil getting out there and, and making the water kind of murky, as well as providing sort of an acidification effect that could harm coral growth. So, my project, uh, and I won't spend too much time on this, is basically just taking a lot of samples of water from the fish pond itself and looking at them here uh, again. The, uh, the uh, chemical pieces we were looking at, I'm trying to keep track of the oxygen and this carbonic acid kind of members on the right hand side. And then basically getting the two of those allows me to keep track of both the biology and the chemistry at the same time. And I use those two pieces to try to get a full, a full big picture. And what I can do from this hopefully over a very long period of time, I've been at this project for about a year, is to develop an understanding about how the restoration has been going because we do have some information from before it started, how it's, you know, how the fish pond is experiencing the restoration now, and what we might be able to keep track of going forward. So basically a review of the restoration and how it affects the resiliency and sustainability, and what lessons we can take from that going forward to other parts of the island and other parts of the Pacific. So just to give you a quick idea of what the fish pond looks like, and where my sampling plan is within it, each one of these stars is a spot in the fish pond where I take a bottle of water, uh, at surface and at depth. So I have a very wide range. I got, I got a lot of space that I cover, take a lot of samples, and this gives me a lot of data to look at. And over the course of a year, a lot of time to work with. So it gives us a very full picture about what the average day in the fish pond might look like. And using that baseline, in the future, we can track changes related to things like sea level rise or 
agricultural change on land. So developing this initial baseline of what normal looks like will tell us a lot about uh, changes we want to keep track of in the future. So this project, I'm, I'm still a student. I'm still working on it. I'm in the lab five days a week, pretty much, uh, working through my samples. But I did want to share with you guys just some like preliminary results, uh, a very steady pattern that we're seeing in the fish pond itself. Um, so to give you an idea, figures are tend to be very complicated. Uh, but the, the figure I have here is basically a map of the fish pond that I've color coded to demonstrate some of the chemical elements we're keeping track of. So on the left-hand side, what I have is salinity, just how salty the water is. And the warmer, greener, yellow colors are where there's more seawater, more salt. And the cooler, bluer colors are where there's more fresh water. And we know that the stream is up here, this north end of the pond. And just as we would expect, that's where we see the most uh, fresh water. And what's interesting is that what we see from this graph is that fresh water appears to be flowing down the Malka side of the fish pond. And what we would what we use this, this uh, image to tell us is that if our assumptions are correct about you know, where sediment goes and how that affects the chemistry, we'll see similar patterns in how oxygen and carbon get utilized in the fish pond. And in fact, we do. On the right-hand picture here, we're now looking at oxygen. And the colder colors here are basically areas where there's less oxygen than we would expect to see, in the sense where oxygen is being used up by by a large portion. Um, and what this image is showing us is that at the end of the freshwater pathway, where the stream is ending, we see a lot of oxygen being drawn down. Um, if our assumptions are correct and that there is a link between carbon and oxygen, we'll see a similar pattern in the carbon data. And in fact, we do. On these two graphs, we see our carbon elements, these TA and DIC. In both cases, we see large amounts of carbon in the same area where there was low oxygen. What that informs us, is in a sense, in, in, the, in the large takeaway, is that this pattern of where fresh water goes and what sort of cycles of biology occur are very closely related. In the fish pond, there is a very, very large presence of seawater. So the, what, what the ocean is doing at large is very important. So you would expect it to be almost all the, all the same everywhere. But in fact, what the data is showing is that the biology, especially the coastal biology, where sediments and microbes end up, can play a very large role in what fish might experience in terms of oxygen and acidity. Um, so these efforts that are being made to restore the pond and change where fl water flows and where sediment ends up can have a profound effect in the future. And so I think that that's the most that I could go through today. And I think we're happy to turn around to any questions. Okay, so um, if anybody has any questions, uh, just feel free to turn your microphone on. Um, you don't have to turn your video on. Um, but I, I'm just going to start off with a question. So Evan, this is for you. Um, so you know your sampling sites or whatnot. Um, was that chosen just randomly? Because I can see, you know, different structures inside the pond. Yeah. Or was it like, I, I can see it's not proportional. So they're kind of just like all over the place um, or yeah. was it just like uh, you just chose different spots just randomly? Yeah, uh, no, so it, this is actually, it's one of the great things about the, the NUR, the research reserve is that, uh, and I think Shimi will talk about this uh, in her talk, mm -hmm. is that there is an effort to sort of combine all these different research efforts together. So mm -hmm. my sites were chosen based on sites that other people have done the research that so okay. we can like layer all of our studies yeah, together yeah. and draw really big pictures. Okay, I just was wondering about that, the sample size. And um, anybody else got any questions? Just a little, uh, I don't know if you saw my little um, chat to you, Fred. I don't know if you were talking farther away from the microphone sometimes when you turn your head, but there was a little feedback echo. Um, I know Zena turned off her, her microphone just to kind of help out, <laughs> but just wanted to. Yeah, sorry, um, I don't know why that was. So there's a question from Alicia, if you want to ask them. <laughs> what, oh. So the question is, oh, go ahead, Alicia. I wasn't sure like who exactly to direct this to, but I was just wondering what the future plans um, for the fish pond infrastructure are um, in the wake of sea level rise. Um, I think with 
sort of minor sea level rise, the plan is to just build the wall that much higher. Um, so the, they're almost finished with rebuilding the wall as it was. Um, they've almost come around a full circle. Um, but yeah, I mean, with, with sea level rise, they're gonna have to keep going, keep building it up. Um, with more drastic sea level rise, like the six foot scenario, or even the three foot, um, there's some talk of uh, actually migrating the pond or building new ponds further in the wetland. Um, so that as sea level rises, you still have uh, functional fish ponds um, in the in the place where that ocean chemistry, the salt and the fresh water are mixing. Um, so that could be a possibility. Um, in fact, you know, a place like Hawaii Kai that where it has that long narrow harbor going in, that there used to be a series of ponds in that harbor. So maybe something similar would happen in the area. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Just feel free, we have about like two minutes because I just kind of want to end it, you know, like on time. Anybody? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. just wondering if anyone has any thoughts on volunteer opportunities. Um, my son participated in an Eagle project at the actual fish pond and I was just wondering if there were any other possibilities for volunteering there that um, might be available to teenagers, high school kids. Yeah, so I just put my email into the chat so you can always feel free to email me and, and I can um, match you up with uh, probably at this point, Kaku'u Oivi, which is taking care of the wetland. They're the ones who may open up first for volunteers. The fish pond is still uh, not really accepting volunteers, but when they do, um, you can email me and, and get on the list for that. And then I also want to just let Melani uh, come on and talk a little bit about her organization because they do a lot of work in the area too. Thanks. We are accepting volunteers. Um, I can put my email in as well, but I, I really do appreciate listening to all these talks and hearing about the restoration work that's going on around the area that we care for at Heia State Park in the, the lower areas of the wetland just outside of the fish pond wall. So we've been working there for five years um, and doing similar, similar research um, on a much more toned down kind of in-house level. So really do appreciate everything that's going on and um, NERS and Fred and Evan and Koivi and Piper are doing and there's amazing, amazing work going on in that area. I just wanted to add to um, that your work is being appreciated by a lot of birders and um, other people out with cameras and binoculars right now because your habitat is getting so good that it's actually attracting migratory birds and some rarities. So there's a lot of people that are not here telling you thanks that are thanking you. <laughs> we, we got some great photos of birders birding today. I just <laughs> thought it was really funny because there were a lot of people with big cameras down there and it, it, was, it was just cute to get photos of them rather than the birds. <laughs> I was, was actually a very... special bird that people were looking at. Um, there's a hooded merganser that's been hanging around, and now there's a spotted right. sandpiper, which really likes the mud, and um, so it's it's great habitat right now. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully in the future there's um, more birding infrastructure too. Um, I mean that's kind of the long term plan is. Um, even on, on the wetland side to open up some of those areas that used to be mangrove and um, as the birds come back there, you know, provide trails and things that people can walk on to see the birds. And definitely keep up the good labeling with, you know, showing some of the native plants on the signage and um, other things, you know, maybe more, more birding signs and things like that too. And definitely some, as much cultural signage as you can, because it, it really is a great opportunity for education. 
Okay, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Okay. Um, I guess with that, um, I want to say mahalo to all our speakers as well as everybody out there that came and attended. Um, hopefully you guys can make next week's um, talk on the 21st, I believe. And we have another set of three speakers. Um, and with that, um, thank you all for joining us and have a great night. Aloha. Thank you guys. Thank you all. All right, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>